we are uh, to continue now with uh, the next uh, session, who is going to be moderated by Gregorius Fontas. Gregorius is already here with us, so I give you the floor, from, uh, Gregorius, so that you can present all the speakers of this session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Francis. Thank you, Glenn, for the excellent for sharing the excellent session before. Uh, welcome again here. This is Greg. This is Greg Fundas. I am a lecturer in the Transport Research Institute of Edinburgh Neighbour University. I'm working in areas of traffic safety and travel behaviour, so I believe that the, the discussion that we will have in this session will be exciting and very interesting. At least it's very interesting for me as far as I have seen from the abstracts and the work that will be presented today. I don't want to spend a lot of minutes uh, with introductions, uh, just to mention as an initial statement that today we will be focusing on the impact on this session here, the session two, we will be focusing on the impact of COVID-19 of travel demand and particularly on different aspects, quite diverse aspects of travel demand, ranging from residential relocation to public health outcomes on the use of public transport and commuting. So I guess we will have a quite interesting internet intellectual exchange. I am for, for, for those that you have or you have just joined the session, just to remind you that we will have a QA session and a question and answer session in the end. Uh, so please, if you have any questions in the meanwhile, uh, please type them only in written format in the chat box. And uh, with the help of Wences and the great team in IT, I will receive the questions in the end and we will have a very nice QA session. Uh, so I will not spend more time on the introductory stuff. I will quickly go to the, our first presenter, uh, who is Ajay, Ajay Saxena, uh, from Transport Research Institute in Edinburgh, at Edinburgh Never University. Uh, well, Ajay is quite familiar with to me. We have worked together over the last couple of years. However, Ajay Saxena right now is a graduate consultant at Sistra. Uh, he has recently completed his MSc in Transport Planning and Engineering with distinction. Uh, from the Edinburgh Neighbour University. He has been involved as an architect for nine years on urban ra rail projects in India, Southeast Asia and Middle East. The topic of the presentation of uh, Ajay is uh, residential relocation after COVID-19. Ajay, the floor is yours. Hi. Uh, good morning, everyone. I still don't get... Uh the option to share my screen. Am I audible? Yeah, excellent. Thank you very much. Yeah. We can see the first slide of your presentation. Thank you. Right. Okay. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Greg, for the nice introduction. Uh, Transport Research Institute at Edinburgh Napier University is studying the long and short term impact of COVID 19. I'm Ajay Saxena, and I'll be sharing our findings of COVID 19's impact on residential relocations. Choice of residence. If we look at how people choose the place they reside at, the conventional decision-making factors are proximity to their place of work, proximity to commercial, recreational, essential services, and transport options, affordability that applies to both housing and transport costs, and of course, safety. We can see that the decision is based on a balance between accessibility and affordability. Uh, motivation for research. Post COVID-19, the mode of accessibility has significantly shifted to digital and that may start to influence the residential location choice among individuals. Intention to relocate and the, cho and the choice of uh, type of area that is urban or non-urban are analyzed in this study. Data collection. We conducted an online survey offered to Scottish residents in February 2021 and collected 994 responses. Quota constraints for age, gender and household income were enforced to get a sample that is representative of the Scottish population. The questionnaire focused on perceptions of importance, fear, satisfaction, danger, transmission risk of COVID-19, travel behavior before, during lockdowns, and future intentions, lifestyle changes during lockdowns and expectations for the future, residential location choices, trust on sources of information and advice related to COVID-19, 
social demographic characteristics the key characteristics of the sample are hyperlinked here which may be referred separately now what we looked at we aimed to identify the characteristics of people intending to relocate at different timelines that is within five years after five years or never and to different area types that is urban or non-urban we asked if respondents intend to relocate after COVID-19 and a total of 40% responded in the affirmative with 27.5% intending to relocate within five years and 13% after five years. And this, this is the first dependent variable. Among these 40%, people were asked if they intend to relocate within their local area, outside their local area within Scotland or outside Scotland. Their present and desired location to relocate were also asked. Those intending to relocate in Scotland within or outside their local area were assigned urban and non-urban urban and non-urban status for their present and desired locations to arrive at four relocation types from non-urban to non-urban, from non-urban to urban, from urban to non-urban, and from urban to urban. Choice of area type of these two cohorts, that is urban residents and non-urban residents, form the second dependent variable. Methodology and definitions. Since the outcomes relocate in near future and relocate in distant future are expected to share unobserved effects a nested model framework is used to model intention to relocate for choice of area type a random parameter binary model is used the models are estimated separately for respondents residing in urban and non-urban locations coming to quick definitions now the councils of aberdeen city dundee city edinburgh city and glasgow city have population higher than 125,000. And that is the threshold for large urban areas defined by Scottish government. Hence, these four councils were assigned urban status. Remaining 28 councils of Scotland are assigned non-urban status. The four relocation types identified in the previous slide are accordingly worked out to model choice of area type. Coming to the model estimation results, starting with intention to relocate. The direction of effect of a variable is indicated by arrows Green arrow indicates increased likelihood of relocating and red arrow mean increased likelihood of non-relocating. The table shows the attributes that influence the relocation intention at branch level. So the decision to relocate or not is based on the following. Individuals who find monthly bills affordable, who did not contract COVID and who reported higher compliance of travel regulations during COVID-19 have increased likelihood of not relocating. Individuals who were slightly satisfied or slightly dissatisfied with life before the pandemic have increased likelihood of relocating. Now looking at those intending to relocate in near future or within five years, the findings are those aged 18 to 34 uh, qualified as a postgraduate with no home ownership uh, have higher likelihood of relocating in near future. Additionally, they feel that the pandemic completely changed their lives. The preferences and reasons of relocation are they want a different lifestyle, a smaller or cheaper property, proximity to good services and amenities, a non-urban location, and have a change in employment situation or family circumstances. On the other hand, households with children aged 5 to 18 are found to have higher likelihood of not relocating in near future. Those intending to relocate to the seaside are also not in a hurry to relocate. The next table tells us about those intending to relocate in distant future or after five years. Age group 18 to 34, annual household income of 50 to 60,000, high car ownership are found to be associated with higher likelihood of relocating in distant future. Those relocating with a, uh, sorry, those relocating want a smaller or cheaper property, proximity to good transport, proximity to good services and amenities, and a non-urban location. High pre-pandemic use of private vehicle is associated with higher likelihood of not relocating in distant future. Now the next table tells us about the attributes of those uh, not choosing to relocate at all. People aged 55 and above, low household income, those who consider train as high risk mode and walking as low risk mode for COVID transmission, and those who consider family life to be significant have higher likelihood of never relocating. Those who had high trust in their employer's communication on COVID-19 related information and advice have higher likelihood of relocating at some point in time. Coming to the second question, choice of area type. We first present the findings of non-urban dwellers. In addition to the legend here, arrows marked with RP indicate that the variable is found significant as a random parameter. 
green arrow indicate likelihood of moving to urban location and red arrow to non-urban location non-urban dwellers planning a move to urban location earn 30 to 40 thousand annually consider bus as high risk mode for covid transmission have a relocation distance of 80 to 100 kilometer want better proximity to employment and to good transport options the variable proximity to good transport is found significant as a random parameter females and those who do not prefer attending events and festivals plan to relocate from non-urban to non-urban location within a relocation distance of 20 km. people planning these relocations also expect reduced future dependence on public transport because they find it crowded this last variable is also found significant as a random parameter the next table shows the relocation preferences of urban dwellers again green arrow means move to urban red arrow to non-urban urban residents intending to move to another urban location are aged 18 to 24 working outside home or unemployed living on rent and want larger property urban residents planning a move to non-urban location hold a bachelor's degree earn over 50,000 or under 10,000 per year are relocating between 40 to 60 kilometer and want a different lifestyle in a nicer area key findings a range of social demographic and psychological factors are found to affect intentions to relocate and the choice of area type for relocation female non-urban dwellers and those uh, preferring to and those preferring to relocate close to their current place within 20 kilometers intend to relocate to another non-urban region non-urban dwellers expecting to use less public transport in future due to crowdedness are more likely to relocate to another non-urban area this highlights the lost use of confidence in public transport due to pan due to the pandemic high income earning urban dwellers are willing to relocate to nicer non-urban areas 40 to 60 kilometers away a february 2021 survey in the us looking at relocations also found urban to non-urban relocations associated with young population and a relocation distance of 60 miles or 48 kilometers urban dwellers without access to work from home want to relocate to an urban area for larger property this highlights how spatial requirements expected from place of residence have changed given activities like recreation education etc are now performed at a performed at home at a higher rate middle income non-urban dwellers wish to relocate to urban destinations for proximity to better transport and to place of work overall these findings highlight a structural changes in post pandemic commuting distances gentrification or suburban expansion around present urban centers and also explain the sudden increase of demand for larger rural housing noted amidst the pandemic factors directly or indirectly specific to covid-19 are people who contracted covid-19 whose lives completely changed due to covid-19 have so uh, have low self reported compliance of lockdown restrictions are more likely to relocate higher trust in employers communication regarding covid-19 facilitates intention to relocate in a study mckinsey and company found that organizations that conveyed detailed remote relevant policies during covid-19 saw greater increase in employee well-being conclusion policy implications we recommend that policies aimed to ensure resilient growth of both urban and non-urban areas be enacted to handle consequent redistribution of demand for services and infrastructure like housing healthcare transport education policies aimed at restoring confidence to public transport may be crucial for demand management and for achieving net zero transportation targets limitations and future research the study is based on preferences from early 2021 when scotland was in its second lockdown the outlook then towards return to normalcy may not have been as positive as now and perceptions may have evolved with the changing outlook towards covid 19. future research may analyze residential relocations using data in light of the latest stages of the pandemic that's all from me thank you very much uh, for your attention and patience Thank you, Ajay. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that everybody, thanks to also for, in the virtual world, thank you very much for keeping the presentation on time, which is greatly appreciated. We will have a chance to discuss further the findings of your research in the end in the Q&A session. Now, uh, thank you again. I will be moving forward with the second presenter of the session, who is Fidelma Ibili. Uh, Fidelma is uh, probably 
Okay, excellent. I can see the, the screen of Fidelma. Excellent. So a, a few words from Fidelma. Fidelma hails from the Delta State in Nigeria, a graduate of CEC, a, a graduate of civil engineering from Ambrose Ali University, and she holds an immense degree in transportation from the Federal University of Technology in Akure and currently pursuing her PhD in road and transportation engineering. Um, so her professional interests focus on sustainable urban transport infrastructure and her current projects include geospatial modeling of traffic nodes and its exposure along the road corridors in Kumasi. In addition, she's a member of the International Association of Engineers, graduate member of the Nigerian Society of Engineers and a Health, Safety and Environment Committee. So Fidelma uh, will present uh, the topic related to the impact of COVID-19 on commercial drivers and public transport in three towns Sierra, Leno Sierra Le Leone of course, such a long a discussion has been over the last couple of years, actually, after the emergence of COVID on public transport. So we're all looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, Fidelma. Your, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Can you see my slide? Yes, we can see your slide. Yes, you are ready to go. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. So this research is on impact of COVID-19 on commercial drivers and public transport in Freetown, uh, Sierra Leone. So the authors are Simeon Stevenson, Turif, Delma Ibili, Augustus Donko. And this is the outline of the presentation. And in the inception of COVID-19 in 2019, which has struck the world globally, and, and it, it came alongside with uh, some detriments like uh, impeding uh, travel behavior and some major activities. And with this in view, the government uh, put into place some uh, restrictions in order to curb the spread of this uh, virus. Sierra Leone uh, and country was also part of uh, the countries which were hit by this uh, pandemic and they recorded their first case in March 31st, uh, 2020. Also uh, for, for, for uh, uh, stopping the spread of this virus, uh, the government of Sierra Leone also put in place some restrictions uh, which, which are a reduction of a uh, number of uh, passengers, a uh, reduction of uh, working hours, uh, social distancing, uh, among others. So uh, looking at the uh, these uh, restrictions that we have put in place, it came alongside with some uh, uh, disadvantages like a reduction of uh, unemployment and uh, social and religious uh, economic activities in the country and also it affected the uh, transportation system and therefore this uh, study was uh, looking into invest to investigate the impact of this uh, COVID-19 on urban mobility and also uh, looking at the economic well-being of commercial drivers in Sierra Leone and in from this study able to provide uh, in order to provide a realistic recommendations that can enhance the country's transportation system as well as improve uh, the, the uh, life, livelihood of commercial drivers during such uh, emergencies. Freetown is uh, was selected for this uh, study in Sierra Leone. It's a major uh, uh, town in Sierra Leone. It has a, a higher uh, number of uh, population and increase uh, of vehicular ownership also uh, include including a uh, it has a uh, lots of uh, vehicular terminals and it's a uh, it transportation utilization there yeah, it's very significant and it's uh, it has a long uh known of history of a uh, epidemic just like uh, when ebola struck uh, Freetown was also among uh, such towns which were uh, also affected in view of this uh, this town was selected for this study for us to achieve our aim, we uh, used, adopted this uh, methodology. First, we went through an intensive uh, literature review and went uh, about to uh, factor in our sample size and uh, design our, our questionnaire survey. 
uh, first we designed this survey uh, and then we tested it using a, a, like a pilot study. And from this, uh, we, got, we gathered uh, 70 respondents who, who uh, started off this study. We used them to able to understand uh, our sample design. And from there, we were able to make modification before we went further for our main survey. In all, we uh, surveyed 21 uh, terminals in, in the town. And uh, out of our target of 270 samples, we, we realized a, a compliance of 250, which is uh, above 90. 93% compliance from the uh, respondents. Upon uh, our, our data collection, we carried out uh, a statistical analysis of a descriptive and inferential uh, analysis on our data. It is well to know that uh, our survey was carried out through phone call uh, since uh, there were a, a partial lockdown in the town. So this was uh, the best method we were able to employ at that time. From analysis gathered, we, re, uh, uh, we, we discovered that a higher proportion of the respondents were male, which was 94%, and then also a higher percentage of the respondents was a, a driver of 60%, and the age gap of uh, the respondents were between the ages of 18 to uh, 45 age of respondents, which we interviewed. Questions like a driving experience and vehicular ownership were also asked to the respondents, and a higher proportion of the respondents had a, above a 10 years of a driving experience. Also, we looked at a, the uh, available mode share of the, a, of the country, of the town, in terms of a, the modal split in the town. And we, before now, before uh, COVID-19, uh, poda poda was the predominant uh, mode of uh, transport which was used. But during COVID, we realized that uh, there was a decline in this mode share, in this uh, 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 mode of transportation, which uh, Okada had a higher proportion. Now, during COVID, this could be due to the fact that uh, commuters were kind of scared of not able to uh, contact the disease. So, because of uh, the social distance, they preferred using Okada whereby to just be them and the driver and uh, less uh, interaction with people. Looking at the effects of uh, the, uh, the pandemic on the commercial transport, so uh, questions like availability of transport modes, the terminal waiting time, social distance and congestion level, transport fare were asked to the respondents. And interestingly, three major factors were discovered which was a terminal waiting time, social distance, and transport were increased from before COVID and then during COVID. Also, the terminal waiting time for commuters to be able to board the vehicle to their destination also increased from a survey. We also went further to look at the effects of this pandemic on uh, the economic status of the, the, of the drivers mostly and the commuters. So we employed a we call same test. What this test does that it helps us to compare the effects of the sample before and after or before and during. So from our analysis from the mean rack values, we discovered that uh, the driver's daily turnover before uh, COVID reduced during uh, COVID. So the drivers made less during uh, COVID. This affected them uh, drastically. Also, another the major factor, which was uh, the transportation fare, the commuters uh, responded highly that the uh, transportation fare increased greatly. Looking at from also from our mean value uh, uh, scores, we discovered that the transportation fare uh, increased. Uh, but yet, even with this uh, increment in transportation, the drivers could not still meet up their daily target. Another factor also was the increase in terminal waiting time because of less commuters and uh, uh, restrictions that we had put in place. It took a longer time for uh, drivers to pick up from the terminal to destination and also for commuters to get to their various uh, destinations. Another interesting factor we found that was uh, during uh, COVID was that a, a traffic congestion uh, reduced uh, so this was uh, like an advantage on uh, the uh, commercial uh, transport system in the country. Conclusion from our uh, analysis, we found out that uh, cost of transportation increased and then drivers didn't make up the usual targets 
during COVID and also uh, above a 76% reduction in traffic congestion was uh, discovered during our survey. And uh, uh, there was this uh, 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 increase in the shift regular mode of transportation, which was a uh, Puda Puda was normally the main uh, mode of transport in the town, but due, during COVID this uh, reduced and then a motorbike became the predominant mode of transportation. And due to the increment of the uh, transportation uh, fees and all that, this uh, also affected the economical growth of the country by uh, basic uh, amenities and other social basic essentials increased uh, drastically during the pandemic. From our survey, we uh, thereby uh, make some uh, recommendations that could help uh, reduce these uh, effects. We thereby uh, Employ the government and uh, stakeholders if they could uh, lower the tax on vehicular spare parts and, if possible, subsidize the cost of fuel. This could help the transport operators and also during such emergencies of this kind of magnitude, uh, uh, it could also improve the likelihood and the livelihood of the commuters as well. And for a, a getting a, a sustainable transport system during such emergencies. Uh, 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 transport facility network system could be improved by uh, designing and constructing the uh, cycling lanes and uh, walking facilities for the pedestrians. Because from our survey, we found out that uh, most of the respondents uh, during the pandemic, they, they preferred walking other than uh, using uh, public transport due to the fear of contacting uh, this disease. So they preferred uh, walking. So these uh, facilities, if they, they will be put in place and make the network system more friendly for the pedestrians and the cyclists. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you very, very much, Fidelma. That was really, really interesting. And it was great to see, first of all, thank you very much for being on time and for presenting the key findings of your work. It's great to see that the focus was mostly on the perceptions of commercial drivers because over the last couple of years, we have seen that the focus is mostly on passengers, on commuters. We haven't seen so much the perspective of commercial drivers, and this is very, very important. I'm keeping the recommendation for uh, expanding the facilities and, maintain, and perhaps improving the facilities for cycling lanes and uh, other walking facilities. This is something that we can perhaps discuss in the Q&A session in the end. Thank you very much again, Fidelma, for your thank presentation. You very much. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, I think everybody will join me in thanking, in thank you, in thanking you for this. Um, we will be mean, moving forward again with the third session. I'm happy that we are on time, so that means that we'll have substantial time in the end for uh, an open floor discussion. So the third, the third presentation is uh, from Mustafa Ayman Ilam, Ilam from Edinburgh Napier University. Again, I am familiar with uh, Ayman. Uh, we're working together. Uh, so, Ayman is a PhD research student in the School of Engineering and Media Environment, uh, in the Transport Research Institute, actually. The topic of his uh, study is the long-term impact of COVID-19 on transport and housing infrastructure. Ayman holds an MSc in Transport Planning and Engineering. He is proficient and uh, has an in-depth knowledge in the field of transport and urban planning. He has written a dissertation on the impact of social distancing on delays to buses in the integrated Manchester area. And for this presentation today, he collaborated with Tor Ensemble, who is also a co-author of uh, this work. So um, the topic of, the, of Ayman's presentation is an empirical analysis of the factors influencing Scottish residents' compliance with COVID-19 travel restriction. Ayman, we can see your screen right now. We can see your PowerPoint presentation. So thank you very much for joining today and the floor is yours. Just to remind you, we have 12 minutes approximately for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Greg. So let's get started. So today I will be uh, talking to you about the compliance uh, to COVID-19 restrictions among Scottish residents. So this study was motivated by the variations of restrictions over time following the easing of the first lockdown rules after June 2020, as businesses were kept running as long as possible until another major lockdown started in 2021 after Christmas. This led to conflicting messages between the default governments and the central government. So England, Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland each had their own separate policies uh, on like how to uh, control the virus. And because of this difference in opinion, as well as uh, 
great differences of opinion between um, different media sources. Uh, consequently, this has compromised public trust in policy measures and thus their compliance to the guidelines. As compliance to government guidelines is very important in helping choose the right policies to control the spread of a virus, the aim of this study is to investigate the different factors that affect the compliance. So a survey has been conducted by the university in February 2021, while the country was in lockdown. Retrieving information about the compliance levels of um, 994 Scottish residents, the key question responses are recorded on a scale of one non-compliant to seven fully compliant, with numbers in between indicating intermediary levels of compliance. In addition to this, various details are recorded to determine possible explanatory variables that affect the compliance. So uh, according to this chart, the, the seven levels have been grouped into three, with the lowest four being in level one, low compliance, and then levels five and six being in level two, mostly compliant, and finally level seven being level three, fully compliant. Only 819 of the 994 samples were used as incomplete uh, responses have been omitted to ensure consistent results. As can be seen, the majority of the residents are either fully compliant, 57%, or mostly compliant, uh, 35%, leaving only 8% of residents uh, showing lower levels of compliance, with just a quarter of this, uh, this span being um, non-compliant. So due to the discrete ordinal nature of the dependent variable, ordered probit modeling was used for the statistical analysis extended to include random parameters, thus allowing the potential for unobserved heterogeneity. This means that the result of a particular variable can differ greatly based on the circumstance of each individual. So from the results, so those aged over 65 uh, are more likely to be compliant than other age groups, while it is shown that those aged between 18 and 24 are the least likely to be compliant. This, ref this reflects the difference in how older and younger groups uh, perceive the virus. As expected, uh, public trust in the Scottish government is strongly correlated with compliance. On the other hand, those shown to be less likely to comply with the reg regulations include males compared to females due to um, their what was it uh, increased um, like uh, underest because they tend to underestimate the um, like the perceptions of the uh, and consequences of the virus compared to females and um, also those with annual household incomes exceeding fifty thousand pounds compared to those who make lower so the latter initially appears. Uh, to be counterintuitive as higher income households are expected to have better access to facilities that would aid reducing trip frequency and distance, such as remote working and larger dwellings which accommodate more activities at home, as well as uh, there's a positive correlation between higher incomes and education levels indicated by other studies, potentially leading to more accurate knowledge of COVID-19. However, Higher income households also have a greater freedom of movement as uh, a result of car ownership and fuel affordability. So this is likely a big factor contributing to the result obtained in the study. Also, the financial incentive to comply with restrictions, especially uh, fines for violating the restrictions, uh, may be less effective among those of higher, higher incomes. As for variables, those variables shown to be uh, significant random parameters, uh, they will be uh, covered in the next slide. So with regards to households that uh, do not own a car, the results showed almost a 50-50 divide between uh, being more likely to be compliant and being less likely to be compliant compared to those who do own a car. So while people who do not own a car have restricted freedom of movement compared to those that do, at the same time, they have a harder time avoiding public transport for those that still have to travel more frequently or travel longer distances, thus leading to this heterogeneity. 
With regards to the source of COVID-19 information, those who take it from online sources are generally more likely to be compliant. So, however, the reason it remains a random variable is due to the deregulated nature of the internet, so especially with the social media outlets uh, compared to um, deregulated, to like more regulated sources like TV, radio, newspapers, uh, leading to a much greater difference of opinion regarding uh, COVID-19 and um, thus a significant pr proportion of internet users uh, become less likely to be compliant as a consequence. So to summarize the key findings of the study, um, compliance levels are generally very high among Scottish residents. As for the groups that uh, tend to be less compliant, this is shown to be among males, high income households and those aged 18 to 24. While all media sources for COVID information generally lead to higher levels of compliance, internet has a more random effect with a significant number of uses becoming less compliant as a consequence uh, compared to those who take from more regulated media like TV, radio and newspapers. This is uh, due to the much greater difference of opinion online compared to uh, on TV or radio. So in order to maintain the le high levels of compliance, we suggest that the Scottish Government uh, continues to disseminate COVID-19 information through a variety of information channels, particularly online or through television and radio. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you very, very much, Eamon, from for this presentation. In in Hello, fact, everyone. you introduced uh, an issue about the um, information sources and the trust to some online sources, which is something that, of course, <laughs> requires further investigation, not only from us in this session or in this panel, yeah. but also in future research, because we have seen that a lot of information which is disseminated through online sources sometimes perhaps may give the wrong message because it is not based on proper scientific evidence. Never mind. Thank you very much, Simon. We will be in touch uh, in a few minutes in the Q&A session. Um, so now I think, uh, thank you. I think I can move forward with the last but not least uh, presentation of the today's session. Uh, the presenter is Suzanne Kelly. Um, Suzanne is here. So Suzanne uh, is, uh, so is Suzanne or Susan? Suzanne. Suzanne, excellent, thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, is uh, holds an MSc degree in health safety and human factor, a bachelor degree in athletic therapy and training and biomedical science. She recently joined the Health and Safety Authority as an inspector. She has been working in occupational health and safety for a number of large multinational organizations since 2012. Suzanne is a member of the Ireland's Health and Safety Authority. So the topic of uh, Suzanne's presentations is, presentation is the health impact of remote work during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, a snapshot on commuting and other aspects from a holistic approach. Uh, it's very important to see also not the public health impact of COVID-19 as a pandemic, but also the public health impact of the restrictions that have been taken in order to combat the, the, the health impact of the pandemic. And I think your presentation, Suzanne, today is very relevant to this, to this direction. So the floor is yours. Uh, Thanks, Greg. Thank you. Can you see my screen? Yes. Fantastic. So thanks for inviting me here today, everybody, to discuss my master's research, which was on the health impact of remote work during the COVID-19 pandemic. So just to um, briefly introduce what I'm going to be talking to you guys about today, I'll introduce the research question and briefly discuss the methodology that was used. I'm going to talk about some of the results, trying to focus in on the ones that are most relevant to this symposium, and then just briefly call out some of the limitations to the research design that I identified. So um, the research question that I chose to address was whether or not remote work had an impact on the holistic measures of worker health. And obviously this was set against the backdrop of the COVID-19 pandemic, where you know, there were widespread emergency restrictions introduced by the government to um, reduce 
the spread of COVID-19. And one of those that was introduced widely was remote work where possible. And, you know, I think I noticed looking at most of our webcams today, we're still working remotely. And um, so it's still something that's very much um, relevant today. And um, one of the things that we wanted to look at was to measure health as holistically as possible. So looking at mental, physical and social health parameters. Um, so nine different um, parameters were chosen to be, to be looked at in this study. Um, looking at stress, physical activity levels, mental workload, um, job satisfaction, overall satisfaction, pain and then ergonomics. So just to briefly talk about the methodology that was used, it was a mixed methods research design. Um, a Google form was developed, an online form, and um, that had about 43 Excuse questions me. over them. Yeah, can, sorry. Can I interrupt you for, for a second? Uh, sure. We cannot see you on the camera. Uh, is not, this intentional or, or no, goes your camera? No, sure. it says, it actually says that I'm sharing my webcam, so I'm not sure why that's not working. Just to let, let you know, but, but we cannot see you in any case. Okay. Okay, great. Well, I can stop. Um, I can stop looking at that webcam then if it's not working. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> <laughs> Has that got any better, Greg? I've just reconnected it. No, it's the same no. thing. No, I okay, great. Well, I don't need to look at that webcam anymore, but thanks for that. Um, no so, yeah, a, um, a Google form was developed using um, nine different areas are looking at nine different parameters that had a, approximately 43 questions and two of them um, related specifically to transport so one looked at how long it had previously taken the respondents to travel to work and the second one asked what method of transport was used now following completion of that online form a remote workstation assessment was applied using a tool called the rapid upper limb assessment tool um, where participants were asked to send through photographs of them at their home workstation and that ruler tool was applied. So that's how that data was collected. And um, just looking at that online form, as I said, there were um, nine sections and each of these tools had previously been validated and used in studies. But to my knowledge, they hadn't actually been combined to give that holistic view of, of health. Um, 103 responses were collected over a four month period um, from March to June 2021 for that online form. And then the, the second phase was a remote workstation evaluation. And um, so eight participants provided photographs of themselves working at their home workstation. And then this ruler tool was applied using them photographs. So, the assessment was completely remote, was completely online and involved no face to face interactions. Um, so just going to uh, discuss the results then, there were a lot of significant results found. Um, I'm not going to discuss them all today just for, for time pressure, but I suppose to touch on the ones that are most relevant to this symposium. Some differences in gender are identified. Males were more likely to report increased levels of activity and increased overall satisfaction than females and females were more likely to report increased stress levels and um, looking at family type there were some differences identified and um, families that had special needs members were much more likely to report higher stress and higher raw TLX or mental workload scores than those that didn't have special needs members um, also, families that had multi-generational individuals, so if we had grandparents living um, in the same household, they were likely to report the highest levels of overall satisfaction with their work from home situation. If we're looking at remote work duration, there was a correlation between longer periods of remote work and decreased levels of activity increased levels of pain and increased mental workload scores. If we were to look at location then, respondents who lived in a rural location reported higher overall satisfaction when compared with our urban and suburban dwellers. And those who lived in urban locations also reported the highest sedentary hours. 
And finally, just to call out the historical commute findings, um, those that had a historical commute of over 90 minutes reported the highest overall satisfaction, um, the highest number of activity minutes, and the lowest stress levels of all respondents. So I'm going to just focus in on that historical commute time variable in a little, in a little bit more detail. Um, if we're looking at that total sample, the historical commute time was 47 minutes um, on average, with a standard deviation of about 35.7. And in order to do a little bit more detailed analysis on the effect of the commute times, the participants were split into four groups. Um, you can see their group one had a commute time of 30 minutes or less, and then a group four had a commute time of 90 minutes or more. And some significant results were then found from, from splitting the commuters into these different groups. Um, so I'll just look at perceived stress and overall satisfaction then in a little bit more detail. Um, so the perceived stress, there were significant differences found between groups one and two and groups one and four. And if we're looking at the overall satisfaction, significant differences were identified between groups one and two and four. So if we're looking at that group for the, the individuals who had the longest historical commute time, they're now reporting the least stress and the highest satisfaction levels with their remote work situation. Um, just going to look in a little bit more detail then at the method of commute to work. You can see that, you know, over half of the respondents travelled previously to work via car, van or minibus. Um, and looking then at active commuters, so those who walked or cycled to work previously, we had um, approximately 11% or 13 individuals who used that bicycle or or walk to work previously. And, and interestingly, these previously active commuter group, they actually reported um, activity levels about 800 minutes per week on average less than the rest of the population. So what we found was a tendency towards reduced exercise in those who'd previously used them active commuting, commuting methods compared with those who used them passive commuting methods before. So just to summarise the key findings related to transport, um, not having to commute to work was mentioned by 41% of respondents as a positive benefit of remote work. So it was the second most common benefit noted in the study. There was a high variance in that commute time um, from between five minutes and four hours. Um, as I've already mentioned, that historical commute of longer than 90 minutes was associated with higher activity, higher overall satisfaction and lower stress levels. And a previously active commuter group reported less exercise, significantly less exercise than the passive commuter groups. I'm um, just going to call out a few limitations that were identified. Um, as a lot of self-reported measures were used, uh, this, mm, the data may have been affected by recall bias. There was quite a small sample size, 103 participants um, who were predominantly female and um, over 50% of the respondents were Irish. Um, although every effort was made to look at health holistically, um, the impact of some behaviours, you know, such as taking rest breaks, um, having a, a good or poor diet, um, and maybe any overtime hours, things like that were not considered. And obviously, as the research was conducted um, during the pandemic, its applicability to non-pandemic times would be quite limited. So that's just a, a brief um, snapshot of my master's research. I really thank you for your attention and um, for inviting me to, to chat here today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susan. Very, very uh, intriguing presentation. Uh, very nice findings, especially it's good to see all the different metrics of physical activity, well-being, and overall health uh, outcomes uh, in the same approach. That is very interesting. So now I think it's the time. We are over with our four presentations with very uh, with a very interesting uh, and very timely presentations. So, so now I would like to, in to invite 
all the presenters to turn on the cameras and join the, the session. I'm planning to, to have an open, open floor discussion. So in the meanwhile, I will be waiting for specific questions from the audience to come to me. But before going to that uh, level, uh, first of all, I would like to thank you everybody uh, for focusing on different aspects uh, or, or in different dimensions of the impact of COVID-19 on mobility. And it was great to see uh, different case studies across the globe um, in Sierra Leone, in, in the UK, in Ireland. In fact, the, the work of Suzanne also had uh, information from Australia and United Kingdom too. So Suzanne, just for, for your information, uh, your camera is still green. <laughs> no worries about that. <laughs> Very patriotic. Uh, yeah, no worries, no worries. So uh, I have a question, first of all, uh, because I think I have to be, to be honest, I'm a bit subjective for this question, because this comes from my uh, research background as uh, a research in the statistical analysis of this kind of data. So something that I noticed across all the studies, which was, 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 really, was really interesting, is that the data were collected at different states of, of the pandemic. For example, uh, in Fidelma's work, the, study, the data were collected in, in May, June 2020, in the first outbreak wave of the pandemic, uh, in Ajay's work, uh, data collected in February 2021, in Neyman's work, data were collected uh, across different survey waves from, from the onset of the pandemic until uh, September 2020. So I was wondering, and from a practical and statistical point of view, if you believe that the findings that you have already observed in the studies, using the data within perhaps the most serious outbreak of the pandemic, can be replicable or transferable in the future. In other words, changes that you have identified will become permanent or when the situation will further improve from the point that we are right now, will revert back to the pre-pandemic situation. I would like to, to, to hear a quick comment from, from everybody on this. I would start with the order that, of your presentation. So we can start first with Adze, we can continue with Fidelma and then Eamon and Suzanne. Uh, I think uh, uh, because uh, uh, even when the pan pandemic uh, is over or get, things are getting back to normal, the extent of remote working is not going away. So like uh, specific to my findings where uh, relocation was more or less driven by <clears throat> by the by the fact that whether you have a remote uh, working option available or not i think those uh, the trends found will continue okay thank you thank you Ajay. so do you believe that the because of the stability of the teleworking patterns also the impact of this uh, will particularly get more permanent, especially in comm commuting trips, right? Um, okay, we can continue with um, Fidelma. Can you Hello. hear us? Yeah. Okay. Please, can you come and give me the question? My network went off. So sorry. Uh, no worries, no worries. So I was wondering sorry. if you believe that the findings of your work which are based on data that you collected in May, June 2020, where we had the most serious outbreak of the pandemic, the most serious impact of the pandemic. If you believe that the same findings, the same trends will be stabilized after the end of the pandemic, or we will revert perhaps to a pre-pandemic situation as we were before COVID-19? Uh, I, I believe uh, the, the pandemic uh, affected uh, as, uh, some major activities. So uh, going back to normal, I don't see it uh, forthcoming. So there will still be some a shift in normal and after the pandemic. So we, we won't go totally to how it was before. Okay, so your, your opinion is quite similar to Duadze's, uh, that, that some of the changes will become quite permanent. Yep. Okay, thank you. Uh, we can continue with Aiban then. Okay, so uh, because uh, a lot of uh, new habits that uh, uh, arise uh, as a result of the pandemic, people are like habituated with uh, now, like uh, stuff like working from home and uh, also modal shift and more people uh, not using public transport. Uh, that's kind of causing a, a more permanent effect on uh, public transport because uh, uh, public transport is uh, 
much harder to recover after lower ridership and uh, therefore um, a lot of these will start to continue in the long term even like after the uh, pandemic is um, as it, like reduced uh, so, yeah. because uh, people uh, uh, and also uh, more places are adapted to like uh, teleworking it's uh, a lot more convenient for most people and uh, as people have uh, even relocated uh, because uh, they don't have to go into the office as often mm. uh, it's likely that this will uh, continue even further excellent so the consensus so far is teleworking is here to come is here to remain and this will have an impact in all of our commuting patterns okay however going now to Susanna which is great we can see you <laughs> thank you again um, to be honest Suzanne I, I would like I would personally like for your findings to remain also after the pandemic, especially the findings with regard to satisfaction and physical activity levels. I mean, the increase of the physical activity levels. But what do you think? Yeah, like I'd have to agree with the other panelists there. Um, I think a lot of the behaviours will remain um, because they have, you know, I suppose we've we've been come so used to remote work. I don't think we'll ever go back to to how we were pre-pandemic. But um, I suppose some of the findings, certainly around the impact of remote work on social health, which I know I didn't really um, speak too much in this presentation, um, a lot of them were, were negative, you know, feelings around isolation from prolonged remote work that hopefully when when we, um, you know, get to a new normal, we'll be able to combine, um, you know, a hybrid remote and in-person um, work environment so that we can get the benefits of both because there are a lot of social benefits from you know physically being in a workplace that you, it's very hard to replicate in that home environment. Yes, yes, I absolutely agree. Um, and to be honest, now if uh, I may and go to some specific questions for each presentation and started from you, Suzanne, again, uh, it was, you mentioned that as a limitation, the, the fact that you have a small sample size and perhaps different uh, subgroups from different countries. However, okay, I understand that you, the vast majority of, of the respondents were from Ireland, uh, but you had also some respondents from Australia, a small amount of number, a small amount of respondents, and also from the, from the UK. Despite, if, if we, let's say, forget the fact that the, the number of respondents from these two countries is low, uh, in your overall sample size. Do you believe that the different levels of restriction uh, that were imposed during different phases of the pandemic could have an indirect at least impact on this, all these health outcomes? For example, Australia had a totally different approach, uh, more, uh, let's say, a, a bit more stringent approach com compared to, to the UK or Ireland. So do you believe that the different level or the varying level of, of restrictions can have an impact on these health outcomes that you studied? Oh, for sure, definitely. And and interestingly, during my data collection period was actually a time when Australia was in very little restrictions. So I, oh. I um, completed mine between March and, and June 2021. So um, you could really see a stark difference in, you know, um, especially that job satisfaction, performance and isolation and the activity levels between Ireland and the UK, which were quite heavily in restrictions at the time and Australia, which was, you know, apart from, you know, a restriction in international travel, seemed to be, you know, pretty much normal in terms of um, in terms of the COVID response. So um, certainly I think if I had had higher numbers, I think potentially eight people from Australia um, responded. So just the, the data wasn't powerful enough to be able to really pull any meaningful um, statistics from that. But I'd say, you know, if I had, I had a much larger sample size, you would have really been able to see the impact of the different restrictions in the different um, governments of the different countries and the impact that it had on, on the health um, of the remote workers. Excellent, excellent, exactly. Thank you very much. Um, I have also a quick question about, about the study of Fidelma, which was uh, very, very interesting. I saw that you did a phone interview, right, in order to collect the data. So you did a kind of phone survey for the, for the commercial drivers. And given that the focus of this session is on uh, equity and gender and overall diversity issues in transport, uh, I was wondering how 
what kind of recruitment approach did you follow for the phone interview? First of all, I have to under, I have to say that phone interviews and online service an online service were the only applicable and appropriate survey methods during the pandemic. So uh, I'm pretty sure that there will be some silences with regard to recruiting a sample that could be representative at least uh, of the overall population or the target populations of, of, of commercial drivers in terms of gender. So how did you recruit, let's say, a sample for, for the data that you use for the analysis? Oh, okay. So uh, we were able to visit the terminals and that was the 21 terminal. So uh, getting there, we uh, gathered information from the drivers, the uh, their driver heads, and then the uh, commuters, the passengers uh, at those terminals. And then we also did uh, some uh, kind of a random uh, sampling of uh, commuters uh, along those uh, terminals. So that was how we were able to get such information and get our respondents. Okay, okay. Uh, that's good. So you had, let's say, more holistic approach in terms of uh, data collection, which is which, which is good for the quality of the data probably that you used. And yes. I have a last question for Ajay um, about the, in for the, the intentions from future relocation. Um, given that we are talking about intentions, yeah. uh, do you believe, for example, that if you replicate exactly the same survey, now or not or not now in february 2022 which is one year after february 2021 uh would you have similar data uh, i'm saying that because just before i start the session today i saw in the local media here in the bbc news that right now we are in the year where in the uk the housing prices are the highest over the last decade so do you believe that the data that you would collect if you do if you do the survey again in a couple of months' time, will be similar to what you you have seen in the previous survey. Uh, I believe that uh, the intention to relocate, uh, like we would see a higher percentage of uh, people who would be willing to relocate uh, if the survey is done again, let's say in February, because uh, because like relocation is a big thing, which uh, it's not a small decision, and. Uh, when the survey was done in uh, last february the outlook was quite negative to like many things were unknown the the vaccine rollout wasn't uh, like the success of it was not known and things like those so we know a bit more uh, a lot more about the threat from the virus but we have mm -hmm. also seen and experienced the the benefits or the convenience of uh, remote working which uh, probably is driving the <clears throat> relocations. So, so I think there would be a bigger percentage of people who would be willing to to change their residence and go to a place where where they find it better from their current place. Okay. Okay. Makes sense. Exactly. Thank you very very much. Uh, I think we have a quite we had a quite interesting discussion. I don't know if the panelists have any any other question or any other comment that they want to add um otherwise if not we can end a bit earlier so everybody can enjoy a bit a, a bit extended lunch time until the next um session actually until until the keynote of professor chandra Bhatt, which will be extremely interesting so thank you thank you thank you very much everybody thank you for joining this session thank you for uh contributing to this session with your excellent and very exciting presentations i'm pretty sure that everybody Will join me in thanking you. Thank you very much, even in a virtual world, and hope the best for the day, for the symposium, and for the next step of your career, of course. Thank you.